So um, it's always great to be back at the Simons Foundation. It's a particular honor to be able to kick off this series. It sounds like a fantastic set of lectures that are coming up, and uh, um, I'll do my best to set the stage because of the um, the the idea that this was about emerging insights uh, into autism. It's not happening. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it helps. The OM works better than the OFF. Okay, so um, I presume people in the back here heard that when I said, yeah, okay, right? So uh, I will repeat that. But, but, um, but I took the title of the lecture series seriously, and what I wanted to do was just to, was, um, to start by giving something of an overview and really a narrative about um, about what's happened in autism genetics over the last few years, but then turn in the last part of the talk to, um, to show you some unpublished data, sort of what we're thinking about in the laboratory and actually in a collaborative group, uh, to try to make progress um, uh, uh, in moving from genetics to pathophysiology. Not, not an easy thing to do, I think, um, and, uh, but I'm, I'll be interested to uh, get feedback on how you all think uh, we're thinking about it. Um, I guess I have to preface this by saying that, you know, when I've, I've been in the field for 15 years, uh, about that long, and, and I'd say for the first decade, I think I was known as like the Richard Lewis of the autism genetics fields. You know, Richard Lewis, he's the comedian where everything is always terrible, right? I mean, and so I used to give these talks and I would say, well, we've been at this and we really don't know anything and, you know, common variants have not been working out and, and you know, we have an idea about how this might play out, but um, and, and now I realize over the last five years that I think I've now earned the reputation of being a, this dewy-eyed optimist, that I'm like the biggest Pollyanna in the field. Um, and, and honestly, what I'm going to try to do today is to convince you that it is actually um, a realistic assessment of, of the change that's happened over the last few years, that we really have reached a tipping point. I used to, you mentioned Rick Lifton, and I used to look with such envy at what they were able to do, that they had solid genetic findings, that, you know, they weren't spending all their times debating whether or not it was replicable or whether or not, you know, that was really a mutation that was related to disease and used it as a foundation to understand pathophysiology in a whole variety of disorders. And I just, you know, I longed for that. Um, it set a great goal and expectation. And what I'm going to try to convince you today is I think we have sort of passed through those gates now that we have um, reached a point where we have real confidence in the mutations that we're identifying in the relationship to autism and now can take on the not insignificant challenge of trying to think about how, like other fields in medicine, we're going to be able to translate genetic understanding into pathophysiological insight. So um, I'm going to start, I, I, I presume that this is an you know, audience that is very interested in autism, so I, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, um, with, uh, in my slides describing what the phenotype is or, or getting into I think, all the many issues about um, uh, the phenotypic heterogeneity in autism. And all I wanted to do is just remind you that it's syndromic diagnosis that involves three major domains. The kind of sine qua non is a fundamental impairment in reciprocal social interaction and communication. And then there are associated behaviors in the, in the realm of language. Um, and, um, and, and interest and uh, motor uh, uh, behaviors, particularly repetitive stereotypes. Um, th there's no question that this is a tremendously heterogeneous uh, disorder clinically. I'm going to come back uh, in a minute to how I think that that has helped shape my thinking about the genetics. But um, it is tremendously heterogeneous. Um, its onset is in early childhood. Precisely how early is a tremendously interesting area of investigation, but it, it almost always uh, in the first year of life. Um, and uh, the, what I want to focus on is certainly in terms of the emphasis of my laboratory has been sort of the next bit here, which is that, you know, there are treatments. Behavioral therapy is really the, the mainstay of treatment for uh, kids with ASD. There are somatic treatments. None of them target the core deficits. And that's a frustrating thing when you're a clinician because, uh, you know, these can be very debilitating, incredibly disruptive, uh, and difficult, uh, wrenching for families. And to have them come into a physician and have us, and this is why I was the Richard Lewis, I think, of this field for a long time, is to say, I don't really know what's going on, and I don't really know how to fundamentally help you, is a frustrating place to be. Um, 
And that really is what drove me after I finished my clinical training. I did my PhD after completing my, um, my fellowship in child psychiatry, really driven by that frustration. And there was just, you know, again, you would look around at other fields, and even if they didn't have complete knowledge or they were making some of it up, they could talk to you about cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying disease. And when I finished my residency, that was really just, you know, sort of a, what seemed like a distant goal. And so I went back with, again with this idea that gene discovery, if you could get to the level of the genome and identify genes where you had high confidence that that variation was contributing to autism, that that could serve as a critical first step um, to solving the problem of not understanding at the molecular and cellular level. Now, I just want to pause for a second and say that this is definitely a minimalist strategy, but not a reductionist one. So it's minimalist in the sense that my lab has always been focused on getting some kind of purchase, whether it's the one in a million family or a rare mutation where you have confidence that it's related to disease, with the idea that if you can pull on the thread that you'll begin to illuminate biology, it may not be all of the biology. And, and the reason I say it's not reductionist is because as a geneticist, even as a geneticist, let alone a clinician, the effort here is not to identify everything about autism. It's really not even to identify everything about the genetic architecture of autism, let alone environmental inputs or other things that might contribute or do contribute to the disorder. And in fact, <clears throat> I feel that so strongly that I have sort of the, the standard thing in the lab that whenever someone comes in, starts in the lab, if, that, that there's always kind of this period where they'll run into the office and say, I found this in 10 out of 10 kids with autism. And, and I always say, then you absolutely know from the start that that's wrong. Because of the appreciation of the heterogeneity, both from a clinical standpoint, I'm going to show you that this has turned out to be true in space from a genetic standpoint as well. But so this is not an effort to find 10 out of 10. This is an effort to find one out of however many and gain some purchase. All right. So. Um, I, as I said, I want to give you a brief overview of the genetics of autism spectrum disorders and, and sort of a narrative about what's happened. So it's generally described now for decades as being the most heritable of neuropsychiatric disorders based on family studies and, and based on studies of, of twins, monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. And that is a reasonable but rough way to estimate what the overall contribution is of genetics to a disorder. And the answer always comes up, no matter how you look at it, that monozygotic twins who share all their DNA alike are much more likely to also share a diagnosis in the autism spectrum than dizygotic twins who share the same amount of DNA as siblings. There's been a lot of you know, discussion about the balance between genetic and environmental inputs, a recent um, study uh, in part out of UCSF and Stanford, uh, suggesting that these heritability estimates were too high. Generally, people say it's 90% heritable, and now uh, the new study came out saying 50%. You know, in my view, it, it's sort of besides the point. The fact is, is that there, at, at, at sort of the at ends of the extreme, if you are kind of the most genetically oriented person, it still clearly is not explaining everything. Um, and it, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, it's impossible now at this point to kind of uh, negate the important contribution that genetics are making. And again, given the strategy, um, that's all you need um, is, is sufficient evidence that genes are playing a role um, and then uh, trying to use that in order to, to gain some purchase on uh, pathophysiology. Now, despite 20 years of having either high or extremely high heritability, We've been looking for a very long time to try to take a page from uh, Dr. Lifton's book to find families uh, that had very simple forms of inheritance, uh, kind of classic Mendelian single gene inheritance. Uh, and, and in particular, we've looked um, throughout the Middle East to try to find families with recessive inheritance. And it's been quite difficult to do. We've looked for large pedigrees to see whether or not we could um, do kind of classic mapping. And after 15 years, actually, this past year, we published our first paper that showed a, you know, a classic recessive form of autism and epilepsy. And the reason I raise that is because both as a field, there's been a sense that even though there's strong heritability, the great difficulty in identifying genes is in part due to the fact that this is not a simple genetic disorder. Um, and then also from our personal experience, you know, sometimes people say, well, it's a complex genetic disorder, but you think, well, how hard have they really looked? 
to try to find examples of simple inheritance. And I can tell you we've looked really hard, and a number of other labs have as well. Um, and the fact is, is that <clears throat> all of the lines of evidence suggest that this is genetically complex, meaning that there are multiple genes that will contribute, that environment contributes as well as genes, and that there, there are going to be very few examples in which a single gene will have a one-to-one -one relationship between having a mutation and having an autism phenotype. The history of trying to sort out the complex genetics of autism has paralleled what's happened in general in, in psychiatry, which was, for reasons that escape me a bit, although in retrospect I think I get it more now, is that there's a lot, been a lot of emphasis on common variation early on. The, and, and the reason I say it escaped me is because, as a general proposition, mutations or variations that are common in the population have a tendency to carry very small effects. Mutations that um, uh, carry somewhat larger effects uh, have a tendency to be rare in the population, particularly for developmental disorders. Um, and so from one perspective, and it's the perspective that my lab has held, is that if there's any mutation that carries kind of an appreciable risk for autism, it would be surprising if natural selection would not drive the frequency of that mutation down in the population, just given the nature <laughs> of the phenotype, kind of inherently impairing reproductive fitness. Um, but in fact, there was a, a, a school of thought that predominated for a long period of time in the field that because this disorder was complex, it was likely a conspiracy of common genetic variation. Um, and, and there were lots of studies, this is true for, for much of uh, genetics and medicine for a long time, sort of picking your favorite gene and then asking whether or not that was a variation, a common variation around that gene was associated with the disorder of interest. In autism, there are lots and lots of studies. None of them have proved to be kind of um, uh, uh, highly reproducible. There are a couple sort of at the tail end of the period of doing studies that way that survive, but I think it's fair to say that it's uncertain whether or not variations in your favorite gene that are common are contributing to autism. Um, now, the field shifted from this sort of pick one out of three million variations and see whether it's the right one, it's for common variation, and switch to an approach to find common genetic variation contributing to complex disease that um, was quite effective because it got rid of the need to pick in advance. And so essentially what happens is called genome-wide association and you essentially look at every gene simultaneously for common variation. What was clear in the transition from that earlier era to the genome-wide association era is that we had vastly overestimated the effect size uh, that common variation would have. Um, and consequently, we needed much larger samples. The two observations that you would do better if you didn't have to you know, be super smart and pick the right variation in advance and realizing that you needed much larger sample sizes actually really transformed the genetics uh, starting about five years ago of common disorders. Um, so when you look across at diabetes or hypertension, obesity, um, immune disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, these are disorders that were genetically complex, difficult to make progress on, but that combination of an unbiased look at the genome for common variation and very large sample sizes really transformed and the fields, all of those fields, and suddenly there was a reliable way, <coughs> clearly reliable and reproducible way to find common variation. It's in fact, it's worked now beautifully in schizophrenia as well, where um, already there are about a dozen that have been reported and a paper coming out soon showing 60 loci around the genome that are common variations that are reliably associated, which is just, that's phenomenal work. In autism, so far there are zero. So there were some initial studies that suggested from the earliest genome-wide association studies that one gene or another, SEMA 5A, macro D2, um, uh, might be, uh, you know, might sort of, uh, you know, scale the heights and make it to reproducibility as common variants. None of those variants now have reproduced it when the st sample sizes have been doubled, which is quite a, a bad sign for those genes. I think the feeling is, is that that notion about sort of the effect size of common variants for autism is, is probably right on, that we're at about 5,000 samples in the field that have been looked at simultaneously. There may be one new gene kind of peeking its head up over the clouds, but if there's going to be progress and common variants um, are to be discovered, that the sample sizes needed to do that are going to be even larger than that, maybe in order of magnitude larger than that. So, um, at the same time that there was this emphasis on common variation, a handful of labs um, uh, starting really in the late 1990s, and mine was one of them, started to try to sort of plow the road looking for rare variation contributing to autism. Really kind of a classic genetics 
line of reasoning, again, which is this is a developmental disorder with profound impact on social relatedness, often associated with decrease in uh, intelligence quotient IQ. Those two things are known to have, a, to have a tendency to decrease reproductive fitness. Natural selection would operate on a mutation, so we should be looking for rare, not common variants. And um, uh, one lab in particular, he often doesn't get, I don't think, the credit he deserves, was tremendously successful early on in identifying rare mutations um, that had the characteristics of, uh, um, that you know, initially looked like they were going to reproduce and then ultimately have been found in, in, in independent studies to have uh, strong evidence for uh, being related to uh, autism and intellectual disability. In fact, all three of these that I highlighted are from one lab, really, Thomas Bergeron, who was working on this. And so they identified Neuroligan 4X, Shank 2, Shank 3, all having characteristics of being at the postsynaptic density and excitatory neurons, and that, um, an, an interesting story unto itself. This, in many ways, is really a harbinger of the story that I'm going to tell you about contemporary genetics and autism which is they were looking for rare mutations, they were looking for de novo, new mutations, um, and, uh, um, uh, and they were quite successful. Um, so I'd say that being in that, um, you know, uh, working hard in that era, that we were trying hard, he was trying hard, we were moving along together, and, you know, he had three, we had zero. Um, that, so apart from sour grapes, what I want to tell you is that it was an era that over more than a decade really felt as though while there might be some traction in rare variation, that still that, that, that progress was halting and sporadic. That despite the fact that you might get lucky, you know, we had looked through thousands of cases. We would looked through countless families in the Middle East and were not successful. Thomas Bergeron had three successes over about a three to five year period. But really there was a sporadic quality. There was not a systematic way forward to, to illuminate the genetics of, of autism yet. Um, I put it up here because I think it's also an important point that at about the same time there was initially a lot of skepticism on the part of sort of the, the, um, uh, the traditional kind of conventional wisdom autism uh, community about whether or not kids who had fragile X really had autism or kids who had neurofibromatosis really had autism. But over this period of time, in addition to a handful of rare variation, it, I think everyone started to realize that in fact drawing those distinctions made no sense, saying that it wasn't really autism because you had a known mutation that that really um, was, uh, was folly. And so what you had is this kind of picture of rare mutations playing a role, but either through very rare monogenic syndromes that do have much simpler inheritance, or that there were these mutations out there, but it was um, uh, hard, were going to be hard to find and there wasn't really a clear path forward. And, and this is where things really fundamentally change, and they fundamentally change in part because, you know, played a huge role by the Simons Foundation and Mike Wiggler and Jonathan Sabah. And, and, the, and the reason this was so important, people had thought about de novo mutation, people had thought about rare variants in autism, but they took a sample of 100, just 100 kids, um, where there was a single affected child in the family, and they asked the question, if de novo mutation is important, can we see it at the population level? And, and in particular, they had a new wonderful tool that was largely developed in Mike Wiggler's lab, which is that they were able now not to look just at sequence variation, but they had appreciated about two years before that the structure, the microstructure of chromosomes also vary normally in the population, something called copy number variation. So they decided they would look for these submicroscopic changes in chromosomal structure um, in kids with autism, particularly from families in which there was an only a single affected child and they compare that to controls. So the idea was that this is a type of variation that might be quite important, and that if you looked at families with only a single affected child, that if it looked like it was a strike of lightning, it might be from a genetic standpoint. And when they did this, again, it was only 100 kids, but they found a tenfold, about a tenfold increase in these kinds of de novo events um, in, in kids with autism. And, you know, so important paper. Conceptually, the reason that it was so important is that you had an effect, a really significant effect that was observable in a small group of people with autism. Just 100 people, not 5,000, not 10,000. And you're seeing a tenfold increase in some genetic event in one group versus the other. And that, if you were paying attention, was the first suggestion that this might be a way to have a systematic way forward to identify autism genes. And what happened very quickly thereafter was sort of the second important piece of information. You could imagine that those kind of variations would be randomly distributed across the genome all over the place. And maybe this suggests that there's a chromosomal breakage syndrome, et cetera. 
But in fact, what happened is that very shortly thereafter, a number of papers showed that these were not all over the place, that they were lining up, or at least some of them were lining up in specific spots in the genome, suggesting that what was happening is that by ascertaining kids with autism, you were finding the set of copy number variations that were contributing to autism spectrum disorders. And again, these studies were being done in a couple hundred, 300, 500 people, and they were finding that it was not randomly distributed, but focusing your attention. So you have sort of the two prerequisites to a systematic approach. The first is, is that there's a clear difference between cases and controls in an identifiable type of genetic variation. And the second is, is that you have some sense that if you build the sample, large enough that you'll begin to have these things lining up in a way that's going to point you to specific spots in the genome that are relevant for uh, the disorder. And in fact, that's it. That's the conceptual moment because everything after that really has followed from that and being able to leverage those two observations with different types of variation in better samples, larger samples, etc. But that was kind of why I think it's, that it's such an important moment. We got lucky, tremendously lucky then, uh, to be asked to participate in the next wave of studies asking a similar question um, using the Simon Simplex collection. So after that initial study, it became clear that there were very few samples out there that would allow you to ask the kind of question that you wanted to ask. Most had not been collected to look for de novo variation. And if you wanted to look for de novo variation, you would want only a single child in the family affected. And if you could do it, you would want to have um, no first degree relatives who also had autism and what would be great is if you had families in which there were other siblings um, of the affected child who were phenotyped and were not affected and in fact Simon's uh, foundation went out and decided that they were going to build it and 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 then asked several groups Mike Wiggler's was one and, and I led a collaborative group was another to uh, to pursue this question further. And so this is what the, for, I think probably most of you know, this is what the Simon sample looked like. Only one affected child in about 80% of families, there was at least one evaluated unaffected siblings. And unlike many pedigrees, when you see open circles in Simon's, it means something. Because the parents have not just been asked, do you have autism? They have been well characterized both using categorical and continuous measures, and the same is true for the unaffected sibling. And this sample design allows you to do two great things. So one is design the most beautiful empirical experiment, which is if you're looking for a new variation and you have the parents and you have the child, you can use whatever asset you want, use it on the parents, use it in the same way on the child and ask, is there anything present in the child that was not present in the parents? And then either it's a false positive or you found a de novo mutation. But the second thing that was incredibly important about this, and there was huge debate at the time about whether it was worthwhile to do the sibling, um, and, and thankfully <clears throat> the sibling side won, is that in the end what it allowed us to do is when we were looking at de novo mutation, that we and other groups then had the capacity not just to look at one child in the family, but to ask questions about what, what's different about the child with the disorder versus the child without the disorder. And the reason this is so important in genetic studies is that anytime you're doing a comparison, a case control comparison, the thing that you worry about most is whether or not your cases and controls are well matched. And a huge confound in, in psychiatric genetics in fact, leading probably to thousands of papers that are non-reproducible, is the fact that most variation in anyone's genome is a consequence of where their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents came from. But a tiny fraction of all of the genetic variation that you carry has anything to do with risk for disease. Matching people for that background variation in ancestry can be quite a difficult thing to do. But an elegant way to do it is just to stick within a family. Because if you stick within the family, whatever the ancestry is of the two parents, it's being randomly distributed to one child versus the other. And so you can ask questions about genetic events in the offspring, as long as you do a paired comparison that essentially negates the confound of what we call population stratification or differences in ancestry. So everything that I'm going to tell you from now on is simply leveraging this uh, study design and, and this issue about de novo mutation in autism. So the first thing that we did is just ask, can we reproduce what Jonathan Sabat and Mike Wiggler did almost, I think, three or four years earlier. We had 10 times the sample, extremely well characterized now. We were able to look, and, and uh, Mike and 
Jonathan had originally done cases versus unrelated controls. We could use this beautiful design of probands versus siblings. The duplications are in blue, the deletions are in red, so you can have too much or too little of the genetic material in these uh, submicroscopic changes in chromosomal structure. And we found essentially exactly what those guys found. A, a, you know, we, we, a little bit of regression toward the mean, they had about a tenfold increase, we had about a sixfold increase in risk in cases versus controls. Overall, depending upon how you looked at it, that the overall risk for having large um, uh, uh, but still submicroscopic events were uh, as much as 16-fold increased uh, in, in probands versus siblings. And again, this is about 10 times the sample size. So this is, you know, this is the elusive um, uh, entity in psychiatric genetics, which is just a dead-on replication of an earlier study. Okay, and the thing is, for a lot of people, thought, oh well, that's a little bit, you know, boring. And for us, it, it was really the hallelujah moment because the field had been so characterized for so long by people arguing why they got different results using essentially the same, um, you know, the same approach. Now, there are other interesting things about this in the interest of moving on. Uh, but it, we, we did a number of analyses about males versus females, and about um, uh, and about genotype phenotype analysis. And if you have questions about that, there was a lot of insight that was gained by having a sample that was not only large but extremely well characterized. It was really, you know, a, a phenomenal thing to be able to dig into this and, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. So one of the things that I want to point out is that, you know, given my sort of preoccupation with using genetics as a, as a prelude to neurobiology, is that the question of how do you know that a genetic variation is really related to the phenotype of interest from a, you know, a human genetic standpoint becomes really a major preoccupation. And so one of the things that we did is that we saw this increase in the, in the total number, but we really wanted to ask the question about is this lining up in, in spots in the genome? And when you see multiple events in a, in, at a given spot, can you be confident that you're not looking at a random, a random occurrence? Is that really associated with the disease? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about there hadn't been one yet, but, um, or at least not one that was sort of widely used, was the idea of could we create a statistical framework that would allow us to have confidence to say, we need to see X number of events at a given spot in the genome to have confidence once you account for all the possible places that you could look, and mutation frequencies, et cetera, that would give you confidence that you were really looking at an autism locus. Because we didn't want to hand off something to our neurobiological colleagues saying, we think maybe, I'm not sure. What we wanted to do, in fact, was to lay a foundation for reproducible results and then, and then have that serve as a solid foundation for neurobiology. So at, what we came up with <laughs> is this. So with our statisticians, ultimately the answer to the question um, I came from using a classic statistical approach um, that is called the birthday problem. So. Uh, let me I'll, I'll just explain this for a second because it's going to come up again momentarily. But one way to think about is there a difference between cases and controls is to say, well, how many events do you have in cases and how many do you have in controls and, and compare them. Now, when you have a very rare event, you run into some difficulty. So the first is that you, you, know, you might need sample sizes that are astronomically large in order to be able to see the difference, and that's problematic. But the other thing is that when you're thinking about de novo events, a simple count does not take into account sort of the key observation. And the key observation is that the event in and of itself is rare, right? And so the question is not how many do you have in cases and how many you have in controls, but if you know how often that kind of event happens anywhere in the genome, the ultimate question is how likely are you to land in the same spot twice by chance? And if you know that, that you can start to build a, around a statistical framework. And the birthday problem, for those of you who don't know, is saying if, you know, there are 365 birthdays, if you have five people in a room, how likely are two people to have the same birthday? So that had been worked out very beautifully. You can use that same kind of approach to think about how you can have um, confidence about the statistical meaning of seeing a copy number variation ending up in the same part of the genome um, more than once. So that's... The, generally the statistical framework that we used, asking the question about how likely are you to see recurrence in the null distribution, and then do we see recurrence that goes beyond that. And with this, from the standpoint of CMVs, we came up with an answer um, for a sample size that ranges anywhere from 1,000 where we were to about 10,000 people, so we would be robust to sample size, that if you get to four 
de novo, new copy number variations that are seen in the same spot in the genome, that that is um, unlikely um, by chance at a, at a p-value of p.05, but that's taking into account all of the possible spots in the genome that could be throwing off a CMV. So essentially accounting for the genome-wide comparison. So this is, we, we draw a line here. Our, in our initial study of about 1,000 people, there are only two regions that exceeded that threshold, one at chromosome 7q, one at 16p11.2. This one had been seen in the very earliest studies. You can see that there's a very large number. This is almost at 1% frequency in the Simons Foundation sample. And, and uh, this was a replication of, of what several other groups had seen. Um, and the rest of these have come up subsequently. So now we're at about uh, almost the full sample, about 2,700 people. And there's some interesting things about all of these. So the first is that all of them have been seen in other studies of autism now. So um, uh, it, it, we're all landing on the same low side over and over again, which is you know quite quite nice and reassuring. But the other thing um, is that so are um, investigators who have defined a schizophrenia sample as a classic schizophrenia sample. They're finding many of the same low side. They're finding some overlap also with bipolar disorder, tremendous overlap with intellectual disability and with epilepsy. And I want to make clear these are not. Uh, studies of kids who have autism and epilepsy and intellectual disability. We have a significant number of those. These are situations in which studies of kids with epilepsy without overt autism or intellectual disability were finding the same loci. For schizophrenia without obvious social disability, without epilepsy, we're finding many of the same loci. So, um, you know, what this raises is, is a really profound question about even though these genetic risks carry very large risks. So when, when you go out and read uh, studies of common variation, they're talking about 10 and 15 percent increases in risk if you carry the variant of interest. We're talking many-fold increases in risk, 5, 16, 30-fold increase in risk if you're carrying a deletion at 16 people and 1.2. But the question about risk for what? is, is, an, is an, an important and open one and really complicates in a minute I'm going to get to. How do you think about tracking down the biology when you know that an event is quite important for a phenotype that you're interested in but is also quite important for divergent phenotypes that we have kind of conceptually completely separated and had many years of debate about why schizophrenia is not autism, etc. So, an extremely interesting finding. Now, the thing is, is that again, in order to use um, genetics as a prelude to biology, um, is that even though CMVs are fantastic, there was only one CMV there, Norexin 1, that pinpointed you to a single gene. What you want, for, you know, a neurobiologist who, you know, does not want 25 genes with the answer, well, it may be one, two, three, four, or five of those 25, and I'm not sure which ones. That, you know, the ideal experiment is to say, loss of function mutation in this gene leads to the human phenotype of interest. Let's figure out why. And initially, when we first started with the Simon sample, we couldn't do that, and that's because the cost of sequencing, this is for a million base pairs of DNA, the coding portion of the genome has about 30 million bases of DNA, so you can see that you would bet your entire um, you know, dowry in a lab on a single person if you were trying to do it in 1998, and now this is out of date. It's at least probably three and a half cents now. Um, but the price has dropped so precipitously that we can ask, we can do exactly the same experiment we did with copy number variation, but now do it at the level of a single base. Um, and we focused initially on the coding region of the genome. Um, and we found exactly the same phenomena that we saw when we looked at CMVs. For de novo mutations, particularly one type, de novo mutations that kill the protein, that are sort of loss of function mutations, are significantly overrepresented in kids with autism versus their siblings, where we've controlled for the possibility of ethnic differences by using the Simons sample. Um, and, and we see about the same effect size. So our paper showed about a five-fold increase in risk for having a de novo loss of function mutation. And again, and, and this is why I'm sort of so big on this idea that there was a tipping point, that um, essentially simultaneously three other papers found exactly the same thing. Now, it shows the, uh, the tremendous importance of the Simons Foundation because this is Simons, this is Simons, and this is Simons sample. Incredibly critical to move the whole thing forward, but these are not the same sample. They're different parts of the Simons Simplex collection. 
And in addition, this is not the Simon Simplex collection. So the idea that maybe Simon's was like beautifully done and enriched for de novo mutation in a way that you wouldn't see in other samples um, has already turned out not to be the case. Other people are seeing this now as well. Um, but again, this for psychiatric genetics is a powerful moment when you see that everyone is getting essentially the same answer. And the answer that we were getting is de novo loss of function mutations where the protein is killed are clearly risk events. Now, it doesn't mean that there are other types of mutation that are not risk events. It means that these are the ones that we're able to identify at this point. And we used exactly the same idea, the birthday problem. We know what the frequency of de novo mutation is. We know what the characteristics are of where de novo mutation lands based on sequence context and gene size. We can model all of that and ask the same question. How likely is it that out of 20,000 genes, with a mutation rate of about 1 in 50 people for a de novo loss of function mutation, how likely are you to see a mutation in the same gene twice? And this is the answer. So to, if you see two de novo loss of function mutations in a sample size of about 1,200, it's still a statistically significant but not robust to sample size. Once this gets up to 10,000, these will no longer be significant but, but will remain, I guarantee you, highly likely. But once you get past seeing two of these events, at, at the same gene in the genome. The p-value goes way down. The reproducibility is excellent. All of these have now been found across multiple labs. Actually, you know, this has been found across three labs, three labs, four labs. So you begin to see a pattern that we've identified a way to systematically move forward to begin to identify genes that are relevant for autism. The other thing that we can do with this information, we've learned you know, a lot about the genetic architecture, is that given that we know the mutation rates and how quickly we're discovering genes, we can model what is this consistent with in terms of the underlying genetic architecture of autism. So we modeled at 100 genes, 300 genes, 600 or 700 genes, and 1,000 genes. This is our initial study alone. This is the cumulative data across all four labs that have been working up until today. There's new data coming along as well. But we're hewing to a line of 1,000 genes. Now, we could be wrong by a factor of two. Some labs have suggested there are 500 genes. Um, we think you know, our data is showing 1,000. I don't think that the number matters as much as what's the order of magnitude. So I started by telling you we knew clinically this is tremendously heterogeneous. I, you know, I tell all the folks in my lab, if it's 10 out of 10, it's got to be wrong. And this is suggesting a degree of genetic heterogeneity for only one type of mutation, right? This is only one way that the genome can vary between people with a de novo loss of function mutation, that there are somewhere in the neighborhood of hundreds to a thousand genes that, that can confer vulnerability to the phenotype that we call autism. So where that leaves us, um, before I start the just last section of the talk, is that this de novo mutation analysis and looking for recurrent de novo mutation provides the systematic approach. And, you know, very reliably. So we know now if we increase sample size and keep doing the same thing, we're going to find more genes. It reveals an unbelievably heterogeneous genomic architecture. It's given us broad insights into risk that I haven't had time to discuss now, but would be happy to, about the role of paternal age in de novo mutation, about male <coughs> excess uh, in risk, or you can call it female protective factors, but both are coming up strongly, both for copy number variation and, and point mutations. And, and some papers looking at a slightly different kind of risk, recessive risk. As it's been very hard to find anything like phenotypic specificity. It looks like an autism gene is a schizophrenia gene, is an epilepsy gene, is an intellectual disability gene, or at least has some potential to be that. The question about why these ends up with such different phenotypes with onset at such different points in time is a critical one. The genes that we've identified so far are highly pleiotropic. They're involved in a whole variety of, of processes. You can, without doing any kind of fancy analysis, one thing you can do is just take a look through, and I can tell you that um, WDFY3, KDM6B, Col3, POGZ, probably CHD8, um, are chromatin-modifying DNA binding proteins. So they're involved in the regulation of gene expression globally, um, which is, a, you know, sort of seat of the pants that's very surprising to see that proportion of genes coming up subserving sort of this broad biological process, and the others, some of them are well known, I'm sure, to people in the room, uh, um, GRIN2B, a sodium channel, etc. But, so where I want to take you now, though, is, is 
So this is, in my view, this is you know, fantastic that we now have a systematic way forward. I can tell you with confidence that we can give you a p-value. That p-value seems to be translating into multiple labs and finding not only the same scale of effect, but finding the same genes. And that should usher in a new age of discovery and translational neurobiology. But man, it's challenging, mm -hmm. right? So this was my idea based on Rick Lifton's success of how we were going to do this. So we were going to get to a rare mutation, we were going to find the rare mutation, we were going to confirm it's linked to human disease, we are going to find out about gene expression, we are going to create model systems, and that was going to clarify for us molecular and cellular mechanisms, and that was going to lead us to treatment targets. And so that idea, that sort of bottom-up approach I've been holding on to for 15 years, but then you look at the empirical data and, and it's telling you there are a thousand different ways um, to, that this might be happening. And when you have a mutation in your gene, it could lead you to autism or intellectual disability, and I have to stress, or nothing, because even though these carry risks, some people end up with no, no obvious phenotype at all. And so that question of how do you think about translating when you have both tremendous biological pleiotropy, tremendous genetic heterogeneity, you say, well, you pull on the thread, but how do you know when you've arrived? And, and so now I think I'm going to call this like the Waxman query or something. Uh, sort of this anecdote about how this came into sharp focus. We, one of the first genes that we discovered was SCN2A, a sodium channel, um, based on using this recurrent method. And we were very confident, and now it's been replicated by two different groups. We knew that this was going to be an autism gene with loss of function. So I went down the hall to Steve Waxman, who's like the world's expert. He's, the, you know, on, well, one of them, but, you know, at Yale, he was the world's expert on sodium channels, and he has all the reagents. I thought, this is going to be gorgeous. I'm going to walk down the hall, and we're going to set up these experiments that are going to get us around the circle and understand SCN2A. And Steve said, Great. That's really exciting. That's great. All I need you to tell me is what cell type um, do I need to model this in at what point in development? Because if you can't tell me that, I guarantee you that wherever I put it, I can get you a different phenotype. Um, and and SCN2A is involved in early migration. It's you know obviously involved in in, uh, in later activity dependent kinds of things. And, and you know and and then if you put it in a Purkinje cell, it's going to be totally different than if you put it into a, 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 a different neuron type, a, a projection neuron, and you know, and I looked at him. I thought, Jesus, how in the hell are we going to do that? And and that's what we turned to in the lab to answering the Waxman query: When in development, at what region in the brain, and in what cell type do I tell them to go and look for an autism phenotype? So it was clear to us, given that there were this many starting points, that there are a thousand starting points, that one way to begin to answer this question would be through pathway analysis. Right, you could ask the question, what do we know about these genes, and then how are those similar, and that might start to get you to mechanism. But I have to tell you, when I thought about that, my heart dropped, because I, there are lots of people doing great work on this, but I, I, it, I always have trouble looking at that stuff, because I look at it, and it's like this beautiful like diagram, and people say, well, this is synaptic function, or this is chromatin modification, and I have no idea what the next experiment is. And, and, what, and that's what we were trying to figure out in our lab, is can we use this information in order to set up the next experiment? And so we thought hard about why it is that when we looked at the early pathway analysis that were elegant and beautiful and showed, you know, chromatin modification or synaptic function, why those felt like they weren't giving us what we needed to know. And, and there were two parts of it that were problematic in our view. One was, what are you using for an input data set? So a lot of times when people did pathway analysis, they would take kind of the kitchen sink, throw in all of their favorite genes, stuff with a very widely varying evidence for association with a phenotype, and then put that together and, and judge it against some sort of pattern, um, underlying pattern. And, and sometimes you would find things. But, but the problem is, is that the input set then, you know, you were never really sure how much is signal and how much is noise. What are you obscuring and what are you bringing out? And then the other is, is that if you do it that way, you bring your selection bias. Because initially, particularly with the observation that synaptic proteins were involved in autism, everyone's favorite gene, if you landed near a gene and it was a synaptic protein, it was like, oh, that has to be it. And so there was a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that a lot of what was going into these analyses already told you that it was a synaptic protein because it was chosen that way. All right. So the second question that we had is, what's being queried? So when you do protein-protein interaction, those kinds of things, 
Essentially what you're looking at are yeast two hybrid screens. Or if you're lucky, you're looking at a cellular assay from peripheral, you know, something, peripheral blood. They were developed either by folks doing cancer immunology. And from our standpoint, as a developmental person, a child psychiatrist, I thought, you need to have some purchase in human brain. Asking what is talking to what in a, in a blood cell may or may not have any relevance for the kinds of things that we want to know. So, so is there a data set that can give us un, you know, some kind of purchase on developing brain, not just brain, but developing brain? And, and is there any chance of using that to resolve the question that we were most interested in, which was space and time? We wanted to know when in development, where in the brain, the, the Waxman query, when in development, where in the brain, what cell type. All right, so I, we put together a group of people, and they're all very happy people. <laughs> so um, and this is Stefan Sanders in my lab, a, a brilliant postdoc who's been, uh, along with Jeremy Wilsey, a it's like Lake Wobegon. All of these guys are so far above average, it's crazy. But So Jeremy's leading the analysis. This is Nanad Sestin, who figures really prominently. Uh, this is Jim Noonan as well, and a, and a bunch of folks in the lab. But the idea was is that we put together my lab with Nanad, Sestin's lab, who's very interested not just in neurobiology generally, but in the particular question about what are the cues uh, initially involving gene expression, how does gene expression, um, uh, how does gene expression change spatially and temporally during human brain development. He'd been working to develop something called the BrainSpan database that looked at 15 different brain regions at 15 different points in development using initially microarray, now RNA-seq, to ask the question, what are the trajectories of gene expression in developing human brain? Because of all the chromatin modification, we got Jim Noonan involved, who's interested in what's gene regulation look like across brain development. Um, and then we had to get our favorite statisticians to try to help us figure out whether or not we were headed in the right direction in terms of thinking about the analysis. So this is what we came up with. Um, and, and to try to address some of the challenges I've talked to you about. So the first is we decided we were only going to start with seed genes that we had very high confidence were related to autism. So we only took those that were statistically significantly associated with autism with the idea that this would at least give us a way to say that's our best shot at signal right now of linking genetic variation to an ultimate outcome. The second thing is that we wanted an unbiased way to think about how those genes might be related. And so we turned to Nanad and to this BrainSpan database to investigate gene expression and regulation in developing human brain using these seed genes. We would have loved to have done protein, but there are no unbiased protein interaction databases from developing human brain. So we use expression. I'll talk in a second about that as a surrogate. Now, I'm going to come back to this point, but in addition to having about a dozen genes that we could use as seeds, we also have about 160 genes that have a single loss of function mutation. And those genes are likely, but not definitively, associated with autism. So there's a pool, some are gonna be real, some are not gonna be real, but I'm gonna show you how we use them in a second. It's an independent set though. It's been picked out of whole exome sequencing without a functional bias. So we didn't say, oh, we want all the synaptic genes that look this way. We want all the chromatin modifiers. These are all of the genes that showed up with a single hit loss of function mutation. And then finally, I just want to point out that this is a hypothesis generating analysis. So again, our idea was that we wanted to be able to generate a data driven hypothesis about when in development, where in the brain, and in what cell type. So this is how it goes. We start with a high confidence gene. This is Jeremy who's smiling. Um, and I don't know why I keep focusing on that, but anyway, um, so, um, and so we start with high confidence genes and, we, and then use Nanad's data set that gives you spatial temporal data on expression in the human brain. So this is just a picture showing that there were up to 15 brain regions in fully developed brain and that these were, Nanad used this system of, of periods, but you can get a general uh, kind of feeling that periods one through three are up to about 13 weeks. Uh, uh, preconception, five to seven, up to about 38 weeks, etc. So this is a snapshot of gene expression in developing human brain. So then what we did is we said, if we take our seed genes, what are the top genes that are co-expressed with those genes? And the hypothesis here is that if the genes are co-expressed, and, and, and it is just a hypothesis, so I think it's a well-founded one, is that if genes are very closely sharing an expression pattern, um, and ultimately we'll talk about regulation, but if they share an, a pattern of expression regulation very tightly across development, that there's a good likelihood that at some point they're involved in shared function, okay? So this is our, our surrogate to look for shared function in genes, not by looking at ontologies, but by looking at trajectories of gene expression. 
And this is what it looks like when we take our top genes and then we ask, are they interconnected with each other? And I'm showing you this because these are kind of the two-dimensional drawings. But what I want to remind you is that the beauty of this data set is that they're not points. This is overall expression. These are brain regions, and this is time. So it's not just a point of gene expression and its correlation. It really is a surface of gene expression across brain development and in different brain regions. And so we ask whether or not things are correlated. We're asking across whatever region, et cetera, that we're looking, do we see both temporal and spatial um, uh, co-expression as opposed to just asking at any given moment in time. All right? So we do the co-expression networks. We build them around our seed genes. And then we ask, are these ASD genes more connected with each other than you would expect by chance? Do they show tighter correlations in their gene expression than a random set of genes? We can do that through permutation analysis. And then we ask the question, is the network enriched for this pool of mutations that are going to carry risk, a percentage of them, about half to 70% are going to carry risk? And here the hypothesis is that the network that we identify is really biologically relevant. It should start pulling in the wheat from the chaff you should start seeing the genes that have single hit loss of function mutations starting to aggregate in your network if they're biologically relevant. So the, our very first analysis was just to ask in all brain regions and at all time points, do, what does the network look like? So these are our C genes. <coughs> they should look familiar to you. Um, these are the top 20 genes that they're um, connected to. And we can ask the question, are these more connected than you would expect by chance? And you get an answer, yes. It's not like, yes. But it's yes, you get a p-value of 0.02. And then you ask the question, do mutations in additional genes that we've identified by single hit loss of function show up in this network more often than you expect by chance? Again, using permutation analysis, and the answer is yes. So, and again, not an overwhelmingly positive one, but this was sort of a proof of principle for us that you could use this approach. What, it, what you're looking at, though, is all brain regions at all times. And that's not what we wanted to be looking at. So we wanted our analysis to be able to help give us purchase on spatial and temporal and cellular distribution. And the beauty of the expression data set is we could start to break it down that way. So instead of doing all brain regions at all times, we could start doing epochs. We could do three period epochs of time. And we could take a look at each of the regions separately. Right? So now instead of asking is this true across all brain regions at all time points, we can ask the question, at what time point and in what brain region do we see the maximal enrichment and maximal connectivity? And interestingly, so this is that analysis. When we look, there are a couple different things. This is a heat map. I like this better because it shows it in three dimensions. So um, is that we've got, we got time going this way. We have significance going straight up. We have spatial distribution here. And what you can see is that the general signal that you see overall in brain is not everywhere. In fact, there's one really dramatic peak with a pretty whopping p-value showing that the connectivity and this enrichment for single hit loss of function genes is really aggregating around one period and, in, and essentially one region, although I'm saying one region loosely. So what you're looking at here is that in frontal cortex and mid-fetal development in periods three to five, you have the greatest degree of connectivity and you have the greatest enrichment of single hit loss of function genes. So what this is, we think is beginning to tell us is that this is a way to begin to use the combination of mutations that you have high confidence in and gene expression data, a rich gene expression data set, to begin to develop data-driven hypotheses. So our p-value goes from p.02. We now, in, in, instead of looking in all brain regions, when we look in frontal cortex only, this is now all brain regions, but only in periods three to five. The p-value gets better. When you look in frontal cortex only, actually, we never actually hit this, um, but we just, uh, with the permutation analysis, we just called it 10 to the minus five. So, and then when you take out frontal cortex, the signal disappears. So again, what this is suggesting is that this is a way to bring resolution to the question of spatial and temporal distribution. So the next part of our analysis, would, and I'm not going to show you the data, but I'd be happy to discuss it further, is that what's limiting this data right now is just the richness of the expression data set, right? So I can tell you it's frontal cortex. If we had as rich expression data that separated out temporal cortex from other aspects of the cortex, you could then redo this analysis and say, okay, we're going to ask again, 
we know that there's enrichment for mutations. We know that there's increased connectivity. Can we get higher resolution? What we've done now in the lab is Ed Lean, who's part of the Brainspan data um, uh, collection group, has generated layer-specific data of gene expression in, in cortex. And we're asking the same question that we've asked about all aspects of cortex. Is there a layer specificity during periods three to five in the frontal cortex? And again, we get the same answer, which is that this is not distributed across all layers. In fact, what we see is only the deep layers in cortical glutamatergic projection neurons as being where this signal resides. So the bottom line is that, um, so just to give you an idea, and actually it's a great way to, to sort of bring this back down to earth, is that this is the period three to five frontal cortex network. And you can see these are the C genes and they're connected to each other. These are the individual genes with mutations that are being pulled in, single head loss of function mutations. And, and the reason that I wanted to, to highlight this again is that I told you that what we were interested in is what's the next experiment. And so you can look at this and you can say, these are loss of function mutations in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine genes. We know that we're, we <coughs> hypothesize that we should be looking in glutamatergic neurons. We hypothesize that the period of interest is in mid-fetal development. And we hypothesize that we should be looking at, at cortical fugal <coughs> projection neurons. And, and you could then say, okay, so our, our, the question now that we want to ask is in these specific genes with these specific mutations, what does the phenotype look like? So again, because you know, the, the idea is to get as specific as possible about what the next set of experiments are. So um, in summary, I'll say that I do believe, and I hope I've convinced you, that gene discovery is building an increasingly strong foundation for translational neuroscience. This is just our way of thinking about taking the next step, but one that we believe can point at least to hypotheses about specific mutations and specific cell types. We believe that this will be enriched not just by deeper brain expression data that gives us more and more resolution about layer and different regions of developing human brain, but that if we can add, and it's what we're doing now, is to look at chromatin states in the same brain regions that we've done expression and start asking the question, not are these genes just co-expressed, but are they co-regulated and can we begin to see an, a functional network around these mutations that are um, uh, that, that we're identifying. In addition, what we can do because we're doing more gene discovery in the autism uh, in the Simon sample is to ask the hard question about whether or not this gives us predictive validity. You would hypothesize based on our work that we should be confirming genes that are within the network or a subset of them, and that those would be high on the list of all the genes that we would confirm now being related to autism. And I can say that we're happy about sort of the preliminary result in that. And then I'm going to end once again before I take questions just by saying that this is a minimalist but not a reductionist approach. There was another peak that I didn't mention, which was in cerebellum, you know, at, at later in development. And, and the fact is, is that I wouldn't be shocked as we do this analysis with richer data set with better mutations that we'll find that there's absolutely, you know, that there's not only one peak. We were delighted and actually surprised to see that we would get so much convergence out of such of a small set of starting genes. You can imagine you got a thousand genes, you pick ten, what's the chances that you would even see increased connectivity, let alone an ability to begin to resolve this. But this is, again, one way, a minimalist way, but not a reductionist one, to move from gene discovery to neurobiology. So I have to thank, this is the group that did the initial CMV analysis, so you can see, I told you that I led a large consortium. These are all folks that contribute to the Simon Simplex uh, Collection Genetics Consortium. This is my lab. Um, as it stood at Yale, um, and, and, and hopefully most of that will be moving to San Francisco soon. Um, and then this is uh, the, the later work that we did on, uh, on exome sequencing and, um, and uh, the expression analysis. And, and uh, of course, last but certainly not least is the Simons Foundation of Families who participated um, in the Safari Initiative. So thank you very much. I hope that that was...